Perfect. So thank you to everyone who is tuning in to a very exciting topic where we're going to be exploring the concept of interoception and how we can use motion to control our emotions, which is a topic, it's a concept, it's it's nothing new. I'm not um, kind of making this new statement as far as like, hey, guess what? You can control your emotion with motion. That is definitely well out there. What I do want to do is take a deeper exploration and how we as movement specialists can deeper understand really how, from a scientific perspective, how motion is controlling our emotion. And if motion is not exactly controlling emotion in some of your clients or patients, athletes in a way that you would expect. Why is that happening? What can you do? And can this give you a deeper understanding of really the neuroscience behind emotion and fascial fitness, movement therapy, dance therapy, how you can incorporate music, etc., to get the most out of your clients and your patients programming. If this is the first time that you are tuning in on any webinar and you are not quite familiar with who I am, brief introduction on myself is my name is Dr. Splickle. I'm the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. I'm a movement specialist in New York City, but I address clinicians, so I do see patients um, when I'm in excuse me, in the city or in the States and not traveling. But my passion really is in exploring movement, um, exploring the science of movement. I really dedicated my career to really breaking down the art of movement. Because I'm a podiatrist, I do typically look at things from the ground up and looking at our, how our feet are the gateway into our movement system, the way that our feet are a very powerful neuromuscular structure, a proprioceptive structure. So if you do follow any of my work, what I do speak about a lot is proprioceptors, proprioceptors, fascia, proprioceptors, skin, proprioceptors. So it's very interesting that we're actually going to be taking a little bit different look away from proprioceptors and be focusing on interoception. In addition to being clinician, educator, all of that, as I'm a very passionate mover. And I was a gymnast for years, and my passion now is aerials, aerial silks, aerial straps, and everything that we're speaking about here as far as how motion evokes emotion is something that I can truly identify with because it was really silks and as I dig deeper into kind of the different emotions studying for this webinar is why silks particularly helped me when I was going through some post-traumatic stress and it was a, a pivotal changing moment in how I looked at my emotion and really was my therapy and being able to identify okay I I really do get this positive response from aerial silks and the movement of aerial silks. So it's not just a movement, it is that movement in particular that is evoking happiness. So we're gonna take that little exploration. There's definitely some you know, hands-on, I'm in the trenches with all of you guys moving as well, not just from a scientific clinical perspective. Um, Again, website on the bottom, you can check out all that good stuff. So why is this something that we want to be speaking about? So our society is clearly an emotional hot mess. <laughs> I don't need to tell you guys that. Um, when you look at the statistics of the emotions, and I apologize for anyone who is not based in the United States, as I know that there's a lot of global listeners, is all of these are U.S. statistics. So yours may be very similar, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit a little bit worse or lower. So of the 40 million people in the United States, 7 million of them suffer from anxiety. 14 or almost 15 million suffer from depression. Again, a negative condition. Another almost 8 million are affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're a little bit of an emotional roller coaster that's happening here in the United States, in the world. There's a lot of um, stress from terrorism, stress to produce more, economy, war. We're essentially completely bombarded with very negative emotions on a daily basis. Um, this is a huge reason why I don't own a TV and I do not watch TV <laughs> because much of that really creates an emotion or a negative emotion in um, a lot of today's society. 
when we look at and truly understand that motion controls emotion, the more you move, the happier you are. This is something that I'm not the first person to say this. We want to start looking and see, well, really how many people are moving in the United States right now. If we have a more negative tone of emotion in the United States or in society in general, well, how many people are moving? How many people are using emotion to try to control that emotion? From a children perspective, one in three children physically active, so it got roughly 30%, love to see that higher. Less than 5% of adults are participating in at least 30 minutes, which is not that long, every day. And then one in three adults are actually getting the recommended physical exercise. So 30% of that 40 million people are actually doing some sort of movement that could possibly be influencing or controlling their emotion. We, as movement specialists, um, play a very important role in the way that we can help to control this. What's interesting is that when I see my patients, and I have an office downtown, or for five years I was downtown in the financial district in New York City, so I was seeing a lot of you know CEOs, high-level investment bankers, just crazy, 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 in and out of the office, high levels of stress, and you would be surprised by the number of people who are on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, some sort of benzodiazepine, the number that are on um, Adderall, the number that are on Ambien. It is astounding. It's actually really frightening the number of people that are on these medications. The ones that bother me the most are the ones that are the majority of patients that would be on antidepressants. It would honestly be probably one in three of my patients would be on some form of an antidepressant. And then probably one in five was taking Ambien to sleep at night. That's a, a ridiculous statistic. That, that's not how our society should be. When we think of the power of motion and what it does to emotion, what is super cool about this and what I try to evoke through the images that are built in throughout this PowerPoint or this presentation is if you move, you can control your emotion. So the act of moving, let's say you're going to go dancing with your friends on a Friday night. Dancing happens to be one of the most uh, effective movements to affect your emotion. I'll go into why, but it really is because there's a lot of vertical movement. Any sort of jumping, vertical, hey, like fist pump and raising hands in the air type thing, really is movements that are shown to evoke happiness within your proprioceptive and your interoceptive system. So that act of motion is creating an emotion. However, you can also observe motion and it will have a similar effect on your emotion. So if you are going to a dance performance, if you're going to go watch Cirque du Soleil, if you're going to observe, you know, any movement, whatever it is, certain movements, that's the key thing. You can't just watch someone doing a motion. It has to be a very specific type of motion that evokes a very similar emotion. And then Finally, which is super cool, so you're not going to a dance performance, but you can just look at pictures. I have no idea if this picture that I chose is evoking any emotion in anyone. I'm an aerialist, so this evokes a huge amount of happiness to see these brothers doing their straps. So again, just looking at certain images of certain motion can evoke emotion. Super cool. So, we as movement specialists play a very important role in how we can help our clients, our patients, our athletes control their emotion by understanding motion. One, you got to get them moving, but you have to get them moving in the right way. And another key thing is that you have to get them to understand what is going on from their emotional state. So as we start to explore this, there's a few things that we must first understand to successfully control motion or emotion with motion. One, you need to understand the different types of emotion. Two, you need to understand what is emotional awareness. Not everybody has emotional awareness. Think of, you know, kind of the crazy person going down the street who is just like livid and has no idea. Or the person who is standing and they, they're constantly clenching their jaw because of stress or their tracks are up into their ears because of stress. They're lacking 
in emotional awareness. They, they proprioceptively, and we're going to see interoceptively, don't know that their shoulders are by their ears. That's another huge role that we have as movement specialists is to help and bring that awareness to them so that they can control that, which will then have a response to their emotion. And then finally, we want to be looking at not what movements influence emotion, but how we do the movements that is going to control our emotion. So when we look at emotion, there are four primary human emotions, happiness, sadness, sorry, just scooting that over, fear and anger. So happiness, sadness, fear and anger. What's interesting and I, what I want you to just kind of quick take a look at that, if you see these four, do you notice, does it jump out at you that three of the four emotions, three of the four human emotions that we experience are negative? How ridiculous is that? That's awful that three of the four human emotions that exist are based on a negative context, which means that it is critical for us, for the survival of us, to understand and have that awareness and understand really that first one and how we can shape our emotion and bring in an awareness to those negative emotions to then enhance the happiness side of emotion. So, first step, emotional awareness. There's a big difference between having a feeling and feeling a feeling. And I know that many of you probably understand what I'm talking about. To truly feel a feeling is you interoceptively, deep into your bones, you are feeling a feeling. Are you, are you smiling and just kind of happy and having a good day? Or are you, are you truly deep into your bones and into your DNA happy? There's a difference between that. What we need to try achieving with our clients and with our athletes is to get them to feel their feelings. Again, that's going to be interoception. So understanding emotional awareness. How can we get our clients and our athletes to feel their feeling? This is based on sensory information. So this actually does go back to proprioceptors, which is my passion as a podiatrist and a movement specialist, is that really it is this combination of proprioceptive stimulation and proprioceptive interpretation with interoceptive stimulation and interpretation. Proprioceptive stimulation, we're gonna see in a moment, would actually be considered exteroceptive, where interoceptive would be obviously interoceptors. So external, internal, and that combination is really bringing you your mind-body awareness, your body awareness, your identity with yourself and your identity with your emotions. So your feelings and your attitudes can be affected by actually changing different proprioceptive input. Your muscles, contracting muscles, Every single person contracts the exact same muscles to smile, to be angry, to frown. And when you are stimulating those muscles in your face, you're stimulating proprioceptors. You're stimulating your fascia, which is packed with proprioceptors. You're moving different joints. If I raise my arms above my head and do kind of like a victory, right? Like your football team made a, a point, right? Your arms are above like a victory type. You are stimulating joint proprioceptors. We'll also see that the arms above the head kind of in that victory position is an upward movement, which when we look at what type of movement evokes happiness. You can also, which we're going to explore a little bit, a little, little bit today, but much more in our webinar series, is the concept of mimicry or mirroring. And if you mirror what that does to your interoceptive and proprioceptive system and this concept of empathy. So posture, huge, different head movements, isometric contractions, all of these different movements are going to bring about emotional awareness. So... If we take a moment and I have you look at this girl who's sitting here and we're not thinking about it from an emotional perspective. So don't, don't try to read her emotion, even though you could tell that her emotion is much more of a negative side. I want you to think about it as just looking at her as a movement specialist and think about her posture. She's slumped over. Is she aware that she has that slumped over position? 
if she does not realize that as she sits, as she stands, she constantly has her shoulders dropping forward, she has a little bit of drop of her head, her eyes are always going downward. All of that is, is fed through postural awareness, which is proprioceptive awareness. So that's going to be deeply linked to our ability to then have what's called emotional awareness. So we're constantly dancing back and forth between proprioceptors and interoceptors. If you've never heard of that term, interoception, that is your perception of self. That is your ownership. That is your first person experience. So if I feel like my blood pressure is going up or I have this sense that I have, you know, heart palpitations, right? That's, that's me feeling that within myself. That's a dance between my interoception and proprioception. Exteroception is going to be much more the proprioceptors. Interoception, again, is going to be linked to that body awareness and is very powerfully connected to your emotion. This stimulation of interoceptors is actually linked to your anterior insular cortex, which is the emotional side of your brain. Your limbic sensory system is linked to your emotional side of your brain. When you stimulate different types of receptors, interoceptors versus proprioceptors, is they will actually light up different parts of the brain. Now, how we tie this in as movement specialists is we got to talk about fascia because fascia is hot, fascia is sexy, everybody's talking about fascia, everybody wants the, the next hottest, greatest fascial fitness program. If you are going to be speaking about fascial fitness, you do not want to just think about your fascia as a rubber band, as it has to be hydrated, it has cross links, it has adhesions, your fascia is where you store your potential energy. This is everything that I speak about in EBFA's education. It is your sensory gateway, right? Your fascia is the largest concentration of small neuroproprioceptors in the human body, which means it's sensitive to vibration, and that's how you perceive impact forces during dynamic movement. But I want you to think about your fascia is your emotional gateway. 80% of the nerves in your fascia are considered free nerve endings. This is different than the small nerve myelated nerves, which are the proprioceptors that I speak about in EBFA's education. So when your, your fascia responds to vibration during dynamic movement or you're on a power plate, you're actually stimulating a myelinated proprioceptive nerve. That is different than a free nerve ending. Your free nerve ending, 90% of those free nerve endings that are found in your fascia are actually interoceptive which means a massive majority of your fascia, its purpose is emotion. The visceral fascia, more so than any other part of your fascia, is even more linked to emotion. So visceral manipulation or upside down can create, if someone's kind of doing like a handstand and what that can do, how that breaks a fear, going and shifting that fascia, swinging is shifting your visceral fascia that can create an emotion, positive, negative, right? So when we look at that ratio of proprioceptors to interoceptors in your fascia is a one to seven ratio. That is massive. I don't know if you guys are as fascinated in this as I am, but a one to seven ratio of proprioceptors to interoceptors of your fascia means that as movement specialists, perhaps we've been missing a massive amount or a massive chunk of the power that we could be having with our clients and with our patients. So if we do a back-to-back -back looking at these, and just a little comparison so we can take this a little bit further, is when you when you look at an interoceptor versus a proprioceptor, one is a free nerve ending, one is myelinated. So there are two different types of nerves, okay? When you stimulate an interoceptor in your fascia, it's going to activate and light up through a different pathway, your anterior insular cortex equals emotion. When you stimulate your small nerve myelinated proprioceptor in your fascia, it's going through a somatosensory pathway, which means it's controlling the way that your body controls shifts in gravity, dynamic movement, loading and unloading of impact forces, kind of the way that we typically think of fascia. What's also important is that you want to think of the delay. 
So the fact that your proprioceptors are very fast makes sense because you need them to control dynamic movement. They have to be fast. However, interoceptors, when you're stimulating them, and when you look at the research of interoception and you think of like massage and things like that, you want to go a little bit slower. You want to know that you're stimulating, know that there's a delay, and then you're going to have a response. And interoceptive response is different for everyone. Some of the interoceptive responses, huge one is sexual arousal, tickling, itching, knowing that you're hungry, knowing that your blood pressure is going up feeling, you know, a little bit almost like a vascular constriction, so like tension, right? Tension meaning hypertension, right? So all of those are different. There, there are selves. That's why everybody has kind of their own. Some people are super ticklish. Some people are not. That's their interoceptive response to whatever that stimulation may be. Appreciating that there's more of a delay with interoceptors is important. So what I want to do is find out and ask you how identified are you with yourself which means in order to control emotion with motion you your clients my patients your patients must have what's called emotional awareness or interoceptive awareness how interoceptively aware are you the more interoceptively aware you are the more you will be able to control and use motion to control your emotion. The most effective way to understand how interoceptively aware you are, and the one that most of the research is based around, is listening to your heart. And we're going to do this now. So what we're going to do as we're going to do a little bit of a comparison here. So everybody who's tuned in here, I want you to do this. And if you're not in a quiet place, I know there's a few people who said that they were listening in groups. I really want you to try to do this and do it as just a little test to kind of tune in. How, how well or how connected are you with yourself? What we're going to do is I'm going to have you either sit in a position that you are you know, not touching yourself, you're not touching your radial pulse or anywhere where you can feel a pulse. Maybe your palms are up, not touching your body, you're lying on your back like in the picture. And what we're going to do is for 15 seconds, you're going to shut your eyes and I'm going to have you count your heartbeats. So your eyes are going to be shut. You're going to reflect inward and I want you to sense your heartbeat. So I'm going to allow you to get into whatever position you are. We're going to do two rounds of this. Each round is going to be 15 seconds. So I'm going to tell you when to start. You will start counting your heartbeats or sensing your heartbeat. Then I'll say stop and then we'll do it again so that you have two comparisons. And then what we're going to do after that is I'm going to have you put your hand on the outside of your thumb where your radial pulse is and you're going to feel your pulse and actually get your heart rate and then we're going to do a comparison. Okay? So, everybody is in their relaxed position, you're on your back, you're in like a savasana type position, you're not touching your body or you're sitting with your palms facing up however you are comfortable, your eyes are shut and just take a moment to start finding your heartbeat, sensing your heartbeat. and start counting. And stop. So stay in the exact same position. Keep that number in your head. We're going to do it one more time. You are sensing your heartbeat. Your eyes are shut. And start. And stop. Okay, so you have your numbers. You can choose the average if they were the same, perfect. 
I'm going to have you sit up now and you are going to take your pointer finger and middle finger and you're going to place it on your wrist by your thumb. That's where you're going to find your radial pulse. Again, I would encourage you to keep your eyes shut, your body's relaxed. If you're breathing, every time you do a big inhalation, you're actually going to accelerate your heart rate. If you do not want to do your radial pulse and you want to do the pulse that's on your neck, you can. I would encourage you not to do that one, not that you're going to occlude your artery and pass out on me, because <laughs> I will never know. But, so your hand is on your wrist where your radial pulse is. I'm going to quietly let you find your pulse, and then we're going to count for 15 seconds and do two rounds. And start. Stop. Stay in your exact position. Keep finding your radio pulse. We'll do one more. And go. And stop. So what you're going to do is you're going to take what you perceived, what did you sense when you were lying on your back or not actually taking your pulse, and I want you to compare that to what you actually felt. So let's say when you were lying on your back, not touching anything, you sensed 12 beats per minute, we'll say, or 12 for the 15 seconds, right? So that's your 12, okay? And then when we actually did your heart rate, you felt 16, so 12 divided by 16, you had a 75% average. Okay, so everybody's gonna take a second to find their average or what your accuracy was. Okay. And what the research shows is what's considered a high interoceptive awareness is anyone who can have or match their accuracy around 79 to 80%. So depending on where you were, what your accuracy was, okay? Those who are considered interoceptively uh, unaware <laughs> or less aware are those who are more towards 55%, 60 to 55, kind of that, that lower end of the spectrum. You don't have to tell me. This is for your own self-reflection. And then you can kind of start identifying and seeing if there's things that you match with that. Um, when you look at the research, the way that people uh, interpret this is a little bit different. The more interoceptively aware you are, I want you to understand that that matches to what's considered an emotional awareness. You have a higher identity with yourself. You have a higher uh, self-reflection. If you're clenching your teeth because you're getting stressed, you have, there's part of you that's like, oh wow, why am I like calm down, I feel that I'm sensing, right? So there's that's that continuous identification with self. Remember, this is a continuous dance between proprioception and interoception. To test proprioceptive awareness or sensitivity would be different. That's a little bit different. That can be challenged in a different way, and it is always that combination. So you may have maybe an athlete of yours who's very proprioceptively um, aware, high performing, but interoceptively is like a hot mess and cannot control his emotions when he's on the field or on the court. So you can see how it can affect each of us individually. Some of the benefits of interoceptive awareness, your power, if you had a high percent, is that you have an enhanced ability to regulate your emotions. You often have higher cognitive function, I will totally take that one. <laughs> and you have higher decision making. You have a very selective orientation and you have enhanced empathy. There was another study that matched interoceptive awareness with sensitivity to pain. 
So if anyone who had a high level, 80% higher of interoceptive awareness, and you are very, you have a very low pain threshold, then just know that those also go together. Those who have more of like a vasal vagal sympathetic, you're kind of quick to get into like a sympathetic response when it comes to pain and different pain stimuli, thinking like injections, etc. Know that that matches with a higher interoceptive awareness. So something that you can think about. There's a concept that's called reappraisal, and this is a strategy that we're continuously doing to try to regulate our emotions towards that positive direction, understanding that three out of the four emotions are negative. So it would help our society to enhance our interoceptive awareness. We as a society, I truly believe, is completely interoceptively disconnected. We have no idea when we're starting to get triggered in a certain emotion, which means we're going to have a very difficult time controlling them. So how can we help emotion or controlling emotion as movement specialists? Key thing is that when you're dealing with emotion, it's very complex, especially when you're dealing with anxiety, post-trauma, depression, etc. A lot of people are afraid to face their emotions. They don't want to deal with them. They're, they're kind of putting on the happy face and not really facing things so that to the external world, they happy face and then deep down, that's where they're having their fears and their anxiety and their sadness, et cetera. So it's, it's getting people to be comfortable expressing their emotions. You as a movement specialist, as soon as you start tapping into the emotional side of emotion, is trust is the most important thing. So you have to lay that foundation of trust with your clients as you start to use motion to control emotion. So movement is that gateway into controlling our emotion, but it's understanding what type of motion. There is something that's called the Laban Movement Analysis. Now, for anyone who is tuning in for our three-part webinar series, and if you did not know that there's a three-part webinar, webinar series on interoception, there is. It starts next week. I will talk about it on the end, but we are going to be going into this in much more detail. This is very complex. This goes into neuroscience, into psychotherapy, into dance medicine, movement medicine, music, childhood development, etc. It is very powerful, but it is something that I want to be giving you that information. So no, we can't fit that all into 45 minutes or an hour webinar. So starting next Thursday for the next three Thursdays, it's a three-part webinar series that we're doing. At the end, I will show the link. It's $99 for that information. We're going to be going into deeper what's called this Laban Movement Analysis. And this is really looking at the four different emotions, happiness, anger, fear, and sadness, and which motions exactly and how you do those motions, do you evoke or control that emotion? Remember that emotional awareness is a continuous dance between interoception and proprioception, and we want to be building that into our programming as movement specialists. So our first emotion is anger. Anger is characterized, according to the Laban movement theory, it's characterized by strong, direct, and advancement. So think like a punch, right? If you're moving forward towards someone, if you're angry, you're going to move towards them. You're going to have a strong affect to you. It's very direct. It's very quick. Powerful movement. This is very similar to a powerful movement. Anger and happiness are powerful movements. However, what differentiates happiness from anger is that that advancement when you're happy is light. It's free. Your execution is much lighter. You're spreading, you're opening your body, you're rising, you're lifting, you're jumping. There's a vertical movement, whether it's your arms moving up, you're physically jumping up. Again, thinking about dancing. A lot of dancing is you're, you're going up, you're rising, right? So dancing is one of the most effective ways to change your emotion. 
everybody kind of gets to the dance club and just like dance it out <laughs> or take dance classes or take dance based movements. I know Stacey Lee Pouse is on. A lot of hers is based on beautiful jumping movements. That is going to create an emotion in your body based on science. So light, free, flow, spread, rise. Both of them are strong. So understand that. You can dance back and forth between those emotions. There could be often a confusion between anger and happiness. Next movement or emotion is fear. This is going to be much more of a retreating. This is more of a softer, where anger and happiness are strong movements. Fear and sadness are very soft. So you're binding, you're retreating, you're condensing, you're enclosing, you're moving backwards. And then this compares to sadness, passive, sinking, head down, understanding that if your clients are moving or your patients are moving in this way, posturally, proprioceptively, and do not have that awareness, your first step can bring that awareness, that postural awareness of the way that they're moving. Remember, just from a postural perspective, many people think like, oh, as I'm standing kyphotic, Maybe this has nothing to do with emotion, but they're kyphotic. And you're like, oh, look at, look at you in the mirror. Take a picture and show them their posture. No way. I totally thought that I was standing straight up the entire time. They, were, they had set their proprioceptors to think that a kyphotic posture is, quote, unquote, straight. Getting them into a straight posture, proprioceptively, they're initially going to be thinking, Wow, I feel like I'm like arching back almost, right? So it's like a proprioceptive reset. That postural reset and that proprio re reset is going to be matched with an interoceptive reset as well. So what we're going to be doing, and the last little bit that I'm going to kind of quickly go through, and then again, we just have to delve into this so much deeper in our webinar series because it's very complex. I could probably do a whole certification around this. <laughs> it's very complicated. So personalized motor patterns. So understanding how we as movement specialists can help our clients understand which motions evoke an emotion in them. So it is a personalized motor intervention for them. It's understanding their emotion and how they can regulate their emotions with certain motions. Do they have to do all of the jumping and the arms up and the light and the flow and the free? You don't have to do all of those movements. It could be a movement, one movement that evokes that response with those clients. So again, happiness, the one that we're all kind of going towards is if you do a daily movement that is vertical. This is really why I think, in my mind, I, I don't know, but why doing silks, and it, it was really the act of climbing. So every single time that I would go to silks, granted I was stimulating my proprioceptors and strength, but there was a vertical element that was built into aerial silks from an interoceptive perspective and from an emotional movement pattern and the Laban theory on movement, it makes sense. My arms have to go up for me to go up. It's going to control or evoke that happiness response. So our step one is you have to have an awareness. So I encourage you, do the interoceptive awareness heartbeat test with your clients. Just get a baseline of where they are, especially those who you know that you need to be using motion to control their emotion. What is their proprioceptive awareness? Do they have no idea where their shoulders are rotating, when their elbows are bent, when their, their hands are a certain way, when they're pronating? That has to be built into it as well, starting with breathing, baseline. Yes. Your step one of controlling motion and emotion is breathing. We understand this from a very deep perspective. Understanding tension versus relaxation. Tension is not just a negative. Tension can be a positive, right? So sometimes when we get angry, we, we tense, we make a fist. But can you use tension thinking of like a dancer, like a relaxed tension that we build in through EBFA's education? Proprioceptive, you're bringing in textures and tactile, foam rolling and stimulating their fascia. When you stimulate the fascia, even with a foam roller, it is not just proprioceptors that you're stimulating. You're stimulating the interoceptors as well. That's why they often say 
doing or having different massages can evoke different emotions. I don't know if you guys have heard, you probably have, that we house emotions in our muscles. It's actually not true. It's actually your interoception that you're stimulating. Um, if you've taken, and I had a very good friend that I was taking kind of a, a body flow type class and think like Budokan, animal flow, it was a fascial fitness martial art based um, class based on music as well, which I'm going to talk about soon. And the last five minutes when we were doing some final movement, he was like crying and he was like, I, I don't I have no idea what's going on. And it's, I told them, it's like, that's your interoceptors. It's the movements that were stimulating your fascia, which is your interoceptors. When I do yoga, I usually cry. And my boyfriend who's listening does not know that I'm crying every time I'm doing yoga. <laughs> but it's not like bawling, but it, it evokes a deep emotion when I'm moving in a very fluid, rhythmic way. So our step two is going to be introducing emotion into your movements. Rhythmic flow. Flow is hot right now. Animal flow, body art, budokan, willpower, any of these movements that are based on flow and fluidity, dancing, modern dance, just go take a dance class if you need to, right? A martial art, martial arts is based on that as well, as it's evoking emotion. Remember that Laban theory, flowing rhythmic is a key piece of happiness. So involving music, different types of music evoke emotion as well. Is it rhythmic? Are there words? Are you using certain words? Is it certain tempos? And how can you tie that in? Incorporating vocal releases, which is powerful. Something that I love in animal flow is they'll have you scream. In body art, they have you make it scream as well. A lot of people just kind of house that in. They're thinking martial arts as well, like you're punching and you're making a noise. Think of that release, right? That's a very important part of how you can tie motion into controlling motion. And then you can start to in integrate and incorporate movement metaphors. If you're going to strike something, obviously that's anger. If you're going to go slowly in a lowering kind of movement, that's going to be a sadness mimic. Fear is going to be withdrawing or hiding. And then if you're enclosing or embracing something, is going to be a reflection of love, happiness, etc. So how can you take your movement patterns you're doing to directly influence those clients or those patients? Our step three is much more complicated. So these are for the clients that are not going to be responding who have very, either they have direct trauma, they have true anxiety, you're trying to help them with their depression, maybe they have post-traumatic stress, thinking some of the vets that are coming back from war, everyone is kind of fucked up in their own way, everyone is fucked up. So everyone needs to understand movement and how we can do this. Those that are not responding, those that have very poor interoceptive awareness, you have to address it a little bit differently. This, unfortunately, I'm not going to go into today. I'm going to go into this in the three-part webinar series. The reason is that it's very complex and going to take way too long to go into this into a deeper moment. However, to give you the little tease of what I'm speaking about is this is based on empathy. So building, and for those specific clients or patients that are not allowing the emotion to control that emotion, is have them to start mirroring you. There's a power. If you want to start exploring this, we actually have what are called mirroring neurons. And mirroring someone, not just mirroring someone's facial expression, mirroring someone's body language, but you're mirroring larger movement patterns, right? So I think as simple as like taking a dance class, dance, right? You're, so I'm mirroring you as you're doing certain movements, right? As I'm mirroring, I am actually now connecting with you. And what you're doing is you're establishing what's called empathy. So the mirroring neurons and mirroring with some of your clients or incorporating mirroring with your clients and mirroring motions is going to drive that empathy, which is going to drive the trust, which allows them to then better explore some of those emotions. Again, it's a very deep, we are not psychotherapists, but we are understanding that 
we do have to teach our clients and our patients to take their health into their own hands. I speak of it typically from a injury perspective, proprioceptors, Achilles tendonitis, etc. However, we know that stress and emotions is a huge blocker. There's no way that anyone is going to get better from a specific injury or chronic pain if they have an emotional block. If they have that emotional block and don't realize that they have that emotional block, it is now our responsibility to bring that awareness to them. The more that you can establish emotional awareness based on the foundation of interoception awareness is taking the concept of mind-body movement, mind-body programming, mind-body therapy, mind-body fitness, fascial fitness to another level. So, what that leads me into is to talk real quick about our three-part webinar series. If you have any questions as I'm going into this, you can absolutely type those in. If you have to run, but you would like a, a copy of this PowerPoint and the citations of everything that I've included in this, the bibliography, please email me education at ebfafitness.com and I will send you the PowerPoint. All of you will get the recording and then again, like I said, I will send you the bibliography so you can re research this more. What we're doing the next three Thursdays is we're taking a deeper look. I know that we've already explored the concept of interoception, but we're going to go even deeper. We're going to be looking at the evolution of emotion, emotional regulation, and then a key thing is this mirroring, mirroring concepts, movement, mental states, and how we can have a truly complete fascial fitness program. I truly believe that fascial fitness means that your tissue's hydrated, your tissue's like a rubber band, your tissue is tensing and relaxing, it is proprioceptively being stimulated, and it is interoceptively being stimulated, which means emotion must be in all fascial fitness programs. If there are no questions, then please do check us out, ebfafitness.com. Again, if you want the PowerPoint or you want the recording, education at ebfafitness.com. We have several blogs that are out on interoception and proprioception, and all of our webinars are housed on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash ebfafitness.